Okay, guys, this episode is going to be a strange one full of strange circumstances and call it coincidences or something like that. But sometimes things happen and you do something or you don't do something. Like, for example, you'll have a piece of wood laying around and we can't get rid of wood, you know that. So finally you throw it away and then two days later, you need that same piece of wood, but the trash man has come already, stuff like that. So, let's jump right into it. Semi hollow body, everybody started making them after Gibson. And, have you ever seen one of these? Of course you have. It has no headstock, you know why? Because it broke off, these are infamous for this. This is an Ibanez. I mean, if you went in and bought it new in the protection plan and everything, you might be at six or seven hundred dollars. And then one day everything is strung up and under tension, and boom, something falls over, and you've got this mess. Yep. So what do you do with this? Well, you can glue it. Um, you might play around with it, but it will always bug you. Now, there's some guys that, you know, work on really high dollar guitars, Gibsons and things like that, old ones where they're just like, you know what, I have to have it fixed. And some people say that they make it better than it was. Well, Fred will tell you better is the enemy of good. Anyway truss rod hanging out in there or whatever. So let's start our story. Um, this will be a parts guitar. All this stuff will go off into something that has a need for a little bit better parts. So let's start off with a story. Going back in the 30s and 40s, even a tad before that, you had these big arch tops, these big thick arch tops. And the idea was is that these things would emit a lot more sound, kind of like in, in comparison to a violin, to a cello, kind of that tone different and everything. But you were having people before amplification that were trying to play a rhythm guitar or something in a small uh, orchestra, quintet, six, sextet, yeah, clean it up, really? So anyway, you needed something that would amplify with a big sound box, big old thick thing. But they discovered when you started amplifying these things, the feedback on these can be horrendous. Again, I've told you this before, 1964 Beatles, I Feel Fine. Yeah. The weird sound at the beginning of that is an arch top feeding back. So, um, I've had a few people tell me when your guitars go into big amplification, they're monsters on feedback. So, I decided I'm going to build uh, a semi hollow body and get rid of some of that feedback. Now, a couple other things to think about if you are traveling around um, and you're shipping your instruments and you're going from place to place and you're flying with instruments these things will kill you on shipping and also when you start chunking them into the baggage if your case isn't fit right and you've got a gap down here and this is resting in the case because it's arched and somebody hits it, pow, break the neck off right here. So, our friend Cody Harrell, you know Cody, he's got a bunch of different guitars. He had one that I built, or has one, called um, the 61 Junk Pile. I did a couple episodes. There's a playlist. I'll give you a link right up there right now. And recently, in a tribute, to Tammy after she passed, he played um, for an instrumental on that guitar, and I think enough time has passed, I'll give you a link to that. Now, 
at the end of that, he lets the guitar feed back. He had no idea that Tammy is um, used to like to mess with people and put a big arch top by a tube amp and then turn it on and then run off to a room and let the whole house go. Anyway, so I had a talk with Cody and Cody was saying, I wish that for some of the venues that I'm playing and uh, some of the circumstances, I wish I had one that looked like this but was thinner that didn't feed back so much when I needed it. So I said, you know what, what we will do is I will build, by the way, that's Bob Logg's guitar. Um, when he flies into LA, he, he, he tours the world. He's in France, he's in Italy, he's in uh, Slovakia, uh, um, Australia, England, wherever. But when he flies into LA, sometimes I love guitar like that. And he'll tour around up through the West Coast and up into Canada, drop back down through the Midwest and then go into exciting places like Tucumcari, New Mexico, cultural capital of the world, and then rather than ship them off, it comes back here. And There's been times where we've had his airline silver tones and black tuxedo ones, and Tammy would sit there and play them whenever she wanted. That was pretty cool. But back to Cody. So, here you go. This one is coming together. And it was coming together months ago, and it even had the same you know, license plate with a 61. I got the pick guard drawn out on that, and Tammy had just signed the back of it, the headstock, and what do you know, it took a dive. Yeah, tell me that I should not let him take a dive and all that, and go confess your own sins, get out of here. Anyway the neck snapped off of it and of course I could have glued it back on and whatever but this is a tour guitar we're not talking about setting up in the living room and playing smoke on the water under the swamp cooler in the garage this is something would have to last and um, so when that happened it got put away I actually felt like throwing it away and then Tammy passed, and I realized this is the last guitar that she signed the neck on. And so I talked to Cody, and guess what? We're going to fix it. And I got some unorthodox ways of doing that that you've never seen before. So when I do it and you watch it, I want you to think about some of the things, because Fred Wallachy will tell you about me. He comes from a place of complete ignorance. Th yeah, don't say I knew that. I've got, where is it? I got a chick flick teal rosary with your name all over it, pardon us. Anyway, because I approach things, especially structurally, by figuring it out, I don't get on the internet and watch what 74 other people have done. And I come up with something, because I just happen to have some stand-up bass and cello fingerboards that are really old, ebony wood, hard. And uh, I looked at that radius, you see that right there? And I looked at the curve of the scarf joint, and I saw something that looked like it might just fit. Then I started thinking, why is it that everybody fixes one of these things? They go into it, they have all these fancy uh, Dremel tool cradles and attachments and they go into it. Some of these necks are maple. Maple blows up on you real quick. It'll come apart. So I started thinking, is there a relationship between the splints I'm going to make and the chisel that I could use? And if you could make the splints the same size as the chisel, 
and you had something that was predetermined to be about the same size or the same radius following the same curve, what would all that look like? Well, let's get to the bench and find out. Let's go. All right, let's get a before of this. And I am going to tell you flat out, the only reason that this guitar is not in the trash can is because it's the last one that Tammy signed. After she signed it, it had a little mishap we won't talk about. And the top of the neck, the headstock broke. And you can see that line right there. So it was glued back. But it's nothing we can depend on um, long term. So we are going to have to put some splints in this running here and here. We want to remember that this thing has a truss rod that's running right down the middle. So we can't get too close to the truss rod. We certainly don't want to nick it. And we don't want to get too far down the side here. So I've determined that this chisel right here which is going to come in handy for cutting this in is about the right size so we are going to take a piece of an old stand-up base fingerboard see this here and this thing is very old the wood is hard but what I've done is there's going to be a mystery correlation between this chisel and this here, if you'll notice that the chisel is as wide as these notches I've cut in here. So what we've done is, or I've done, is I cut this on a bandsaw and then made sure it was nice and true here. Put a piece of tape on it and laid the chisel on there and made my marks like, the, like so, you see? Let me make sure I'm there. And did it twice because I'm going to need two of these and mysteriously the radius here is going to kind of help us out when it comes to filing the stuff down you see that there so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and finish cutting these um, as I've scored it here with a, one of these flush cut saws now I can take it and set up a fence on the uh, lighter of the band saws and cut this out and get these two in shape then I will lay those on here or I can use this chisel like so and I can just simply mark where everything is going to go like this you see that And then once I've got that done, remember the crack is right here. So we're going to come up past there. So I'm, as long as I have those marks to go by, I can do that. And we are actually going to chisel out this. We're going to score it first. I can use a, a wider chisel and come along like so and support this neck here. But once that's done, I can simply go in and do this like so and get it just wide enough where this will fit in because there's a correlation between this and this you follow me perfect so the next thing i've done is i've taken a piece of this tape because i want to get a straight line right there once i get that line i can mark off where the chisel is going to stop you see that now this one appears to be just a little bit off so I can mark that a little bit better like so and then what I'll do is I'll make sure that the other side is the same way so I don't end up hitting the truss rod which is right here so we're going to take a handy dandy measuring device that has millimeters on it and one that's a little bit flexible and then we'll come up over here and again this is going to be handy think this out when you're using a chisel the chisel is going to actually set the width of what you're going to set in there so why fight it from the beginning
Okay, I've put a foam block underneath here. Of course, the neck close to the body is near um, as far up as it'll go in the workstation vise. And what I have done is again, I've measured out how wide the chisel is. I've made a couple marks here based on where I want to stop and start. And so then with that tape there, I can take my trusty razor blade and walk down the edge and score where I want to go. You see that? I want to make sure that it's straight and I will do that and then I'll come up here like so. Now, that allows me to take the chisel. I can do a little bit of this once I get going. Now you want to remember, you're going to keep the neck supported because if you don't, you're going to break it off. So you're just going to walk down like so. You can use a wider chisel if you want, but you get the idea here. You're going to have to do this a couple times as you go down in depth, but you're just basically getting the side marked with a little bit of depth from the chisel. So when you start going in, you want to keep the side of your channel smooth where it doesn't chip out. That way, your splint will drop right in and be just wide enough. Now, you notice that this fits there and starts to curve up a little bit. So we're going to keep testing this as we go. And at some point, we're going to start sanding the bottom of this. And then when it gets where we need it to be, we can just go draw a line and get it close and then do the rest with handwork. Now it's just taking the chisel a little bit at a time and not slipping. You do not want to slip, so make sure your chisel is nice and sharp. Again, you're going to work down the side as you need to, like so. Once you get this going a little bit, it'll start to get easier. Now see, if we hadn't scored that right there, it would be chipping off right there. See that? You want those ends to be nice and smooth. Now, I could take a Dremel tool and do this and build a jig and all that kind of thing, but Fred reminded me that Stradivari didn't have a Dremel tool. And so all the violin work was done like this. See that? Now, as we go, again, look at that. It drops right in. So now as I'm going, I can just turn my chisel over. And we're not trying to cut down anymore. We're just trying to smooth everything out. And we're going to round over where things go down into the pocket. So this will gradually taper just a little bit. And we'll get these sides nice and smooth like this. This literally has taken me 15 minutes thus far. But this is the part where you want to be real careful and get everything as smooth as possible so you don't have any gaps. <laughs> because, guess what? Our <laughs> little splint here made out of this ebony wood because we 
based everything around the width of the chisel, it fits right down in there. So, got a little bit more to do on the curve up here. And we will just take a pencil then and we will come along here and mark off that radius. It helps it's of a, if it's an election pencil, especially if you pick a winner. But you would just basically come along like this and mark this off and go back to the bandsaw and cut that just a little bit proud and then you can sand it and do whatever you need. Now of course I'm going to leave this sticking out like a sore thumb because this is a junk pile guitar. All right, little sandpaper that's folded up. That's right to be the size of the chisel. And you run it through there like that and go up and down the sides, catch that little radius at the end there, get everything nice and smooth. And then what do you know, this drops right in there like that. Okay, we're back in non-stop action, act in California, cultural capital of the world. And we've got these biscuits cut. And so what I am going to do is the first thing is I'm going to make sure that I know which one is what. So I'm going to label one of them B, U, meaning Bayside Upper. Okay. And then I am going to label this to the to the top to where it says Tammy there. Remember, this is the only reason we're doing this. So I'm going to take a pencil now. I'm going to remember that the crack is right there. It's sealed up nice. But I am going to take a pencil and I am going to trace this radius. Where is my love pencil? Anyway, I am going to put a mark on there on both sides. And I am going to remember, see that mark? right there. I am going to cut just outside of that with a bandsaw because I have to remember this has to be up a little bit so it can follow the radius when we sand it. So I'm going to take this over to the jigsaw, not the belt sander, but the jigsaw and I'm going to cut this here and I'm going to make sure that I know that this part here, right here, is to the outside. And this is to the inside. You can tell there's a radius there. Look at how different it is. See that? Okay, there we go. Easy money. I'm going to want to take this tape off, but I know where this is going to be and how it's going to fit in there. Now, I want to show you a little something. This is never going to be perfect. So, what I need to do is pack this with dust. And so what I've done is taken this stuff, and this is hard wood. And you see, I have, you see down in there? There's some dust in there. And I can mix that with glue and get this to seat right. So I am going to use tight bond. I'm not going to use hide glue. Let's get this glued in here. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is put a little bit of this dust in the glue. You see that? There we go. And that way, when I brush it on the bottom, it's going to fill in any odd spaces that are left in gaps and, and stuff like that. See that? We'll make sure we get it all over, especially where that crack was. We don't want that coming apart there. We can get it all over here. Okay. 
You see that? I can just set that right in there. It seems to be pretty tight. Okay, now we want to make sure that we're pushing glue down in everywhere. And the glue has fragments in it and everywhere we're putting this stuff, it's sticking up above the surface. See that? And we're going to make sure that this is clamped up good and it stays clamped for a couple of days. Now I've got some big heavy spring clamps that have rubber cushions on them that I can use. To clamp those down and that is not going anywhere all right here's the other one got plenty of wood chips dust in there from the material we're using and yeah that feels good get this clamp on here there we go I'll see you in a couple of days okay guys now we're gonna to get to the fun part of things this might be dangerous to some of you but it's okay we have to scrape down this biscuit or sand it down or do whatever we're gonna do there's a couple of things you could use you could use a parachin guitar maker's knife and you just use it like a scraper like so by the way you notice that I have this can wherever I'm working where I'm whatever I'm gonna do I have this luthier's knife which these are handy they work like a scraper you see that I could use this awesome file this comes out of Stumac. I've told you about this one before. This wood here, there's a lot to do with it. And it scratches pretty easily if you see that. So we're going to have to smooth all that down anyway. So we're going to get this off of here. And we're going to put a little bit of tape around this so we know when we hit the tape we're hitting the part of the neck that we really don't want to hit look at this thing it is a mini belt sander it rotates see here you can lock it in you can get the right angle and i am just going to turn this thing on and watch this Now, I'm going to be able to use sandpaper or just about anything I want to to get that down. And then we're going to use some 
Zappa Gap and some of this dust on some of this other stuff, but that is how that works. All right, we're at a point here where we've got some 220 grit paper, and we're going to just work this down to where we can't feel it. Now, there's going to be a little fill work to do with some Zappa Gap and some of this dust I just happen to have in here, but I think we are way better than we were when we started. Besides that, there's a reason I call my guitars junk piles because, well, that's what they are. They're anything but perfect, and we don't try to make them anything else. There we go. All right, guys, here we go. We've got this sanded down pretty good. There's a little bit of a dip right there. And I'm just going along and sanding this again. Keep all your stuff over here because this and Zappa Gap is going to be the lifesaver at the end. But you can see where the crack was and you can see that we've got plenty of chick flick teal pointer laying around and not doing anything but you can see where that crack was and now you can see that we've got good splinting going on here and uh, yeah I got a little bit more to do and then we'll I don't even know if I want to put anything on that that looks pretty good the way it is life ain't that bad if you don't expect too much all right guys there we go. I've done a few other things to this, um, and you'll see it again. But the story behind this, again, is Tammy, who you see there, passed away about three weeks ago yesterday. And this was the last guitar neck she signed and had a little mishap after that. So I've explained all that earlier in the episode. So. Uh, this is going to go to somebody who will have to baby it because let's get to the end game on these guitars. I like arch tops. I like big, heavy, thick arch tops that are constructed in a way that their tonal or acoustic quality isn't really that great, but your ability to use them to rake leaves or hit the bell thing at the county fair or any of that, their durability is through the roof and they're rough and tough, but they feed back. So I've seen a ton of these guitars of this configuration that seem to be, have broken necks. Now, I don't know whether that's because I see guitars and I'm looking for parts guitars that have broken necks and people seem to steer me towards them or that's my fate or whatever. But the end game here, guys, is Big, thick, heavy arch tops feed back. They're great rockabilly guitars, and if people like trash blues and distortion, perfect. But when you get into something where you don't want all that buzzing and stuff, something will go this way, uh, a little thinner, and might take on this configuration. So, always remember, your guitar case where things sit inside the case. If there's a gap here because your neck is sitting on a piece of the case and someone drops it, it will pop the neck here or up here. If you leave these things sit around, especially if you've got an end pin, so we're going to put the input jack over there. You've got an end pin here and the thing is precarious and you're rushing to get your setup done because the sound guy's running behind and somebody knocks it over, boom. That's what happens. So think out, number one, what and why you're building, and number two, how things are protected. So, I would tell you this. I wouldn't be thinking that there's a lot of money in buying guitars with broken or cracked necks, and no matter how good you are or what materials you have, short of putting a diamond plate on here, and you've seen that in the number 12 junk pile, 
um, I wouldn't count on making a lot of money and having dependable results coming out of repair of neck brakes. That said, thanks for watching. There's always a playlist up there. Don't forget about that at the end. Hover your mouse, the eye shows up, and then you'll see the episodes I've talked about in this. Give me a like and subscribe if you haven't, and thanks for watching. Always appreciate your emails that show me the projects you're working on. See you soon.